This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Ethan Mills, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon, and to Alan Thomas, who just made a one-time contribution to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 470 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is F. Brett Cox, who joined us back in episode 467 to discuss his book Roger Zelazny, Modern Masters of Science Fiction. Brett is the Charles A. Dana Professor of English at Norwich University, and together with Andy Duncan, he edited the anthology Crossroads, Tales of the Southern Literary Fantastic. And in this episode, we'll be continuing our conversation about Roger Zelazny and discussing Brett's short story collection, The End of All Our Exploring. And now here's our interview with F. Brett Cox. All right, so we're here with F. Brett Cox. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. Okay, so last time we spoke, you mentioned that you once met Roger Zelazny, and we never got to hear mm-hmm. that story. So tell us about that. Oh, okay. Yes, we want that uh, on the record. Well, um, the first um, science fiction convention I went to was the 1974 Worldcon, which was in Washington, D.C., uh, which meant that it was uh, accessible from where I was living in North Carolina at the time. And um, I was uh, very young. And the only reason my parents signed off on the trip is because my older brother would be going with me and, and essentially taking me to the convention. And the only uh, reason he agreed to do that was because Roger Zelazny was the guest of honor. And so that is the one time I uh, met Roger Zelazny, and it was at some event. I can't remember if it was the Meet the Pros party or what, but I did meet Zelazny. I did briefly speak with him. I have no memory of what was said. I was probably too uh, intimidated uh, to have any clear sense of it, but it did happen. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, so that was it. And but it is one of my ongoing, deeply selfish regrets that by the time I became professionally active in the field, he was already gone. Uh, because, so uh, that was the one time I met Zelazny. But I did have the experience of meeting him. And I remember attending his uh, guest of honor speech and there are photographs uh to commemorate that so there no photograph of me with him unfortunately that i'm aware of although the university of riverside uh university of california riverside if they ever get around to digitizing the rest of the jk klein collection uh there must be hundreds of pictures from that particular world con so who knows what might show up <laughs> I mean, that's I found it's really tough, especially if you're that young meeting an author that you idolize. It's like, what do you mm-hmm. say in that situation? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is. And and it was just an overload of that, because, again, I'm a teenager and this is my first science fiction convention of any kind. And it was the 1974 Worldcon. And even back then, they were starting to get pretty big. There were easily, I don't know what the attendance officially was, but I'd say at least, you know, about 4,000 people there. And then it's not just I'm in the same room with Roger Zelazny. Suddenly, I'm in the same room with Harlan Ellison. I'm Hmm. in the same room with Isaac Asimov. I'm in the same room with Frederick Pohl uh, and, uh, and et cetera. So it was, uh, it, it was something. So w- was your brother the one who discovered Zelazny and introduced yes. you to him? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Chip is the one, my brother Chip is the one who, who basically introduced me to science fiction literature because he was never active 
in science fiction fandom or in any of the subculture aspects of it, but he was a science fiction reader and he had science fiction books. And uh, it was through his books that I discovered science fiction. I remember there were things like, well, it was his copy of the Foundation Trilogy. It was his copy of um, Dangerous Visions, which when you are, and that was when I was younger than I was when I went to the Worldcon, and that was quite a kick in the head, um, if only my parents had known. <laughs> but um, I mean, they knew I was reading the book. They had no idea what was in it. And uh, also, it was his copy of Lord of Light which I did not understand at the time, but I knew was something quite remarkable. And then when I joined the Science Fiction Book Club, uh, and one of the first uh, initial things I got for joining was a copy of the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 1, the anthology that Robert Silverberg edited um, way back. I think the publication date on that was 1970, and that is where I first read A Rose for Ecclesiastes. So, uh, yeah, it does all kind of trace back um, to my older brother in terms of my um, entry uh, into uh, science fiction, discovering that there was a distinct thing that was science fiction literature, uh, as opposed to just the general kinds of things that I encountered in, in uh, children's books and on television and in the movies. Well, you mentioned uh, photos of Selassny, and we were talking a little bit on Facebook about this photo where he's, I assume it's at a convention, and he's kind of uh, yeah. lounging on a couch with a cigarette, and there's uh -huh. this attractive woman gazing adoringly yes. at him. Right, right, right. And uh, that's one of those Klein photos. And for anyone who might not be aware, J there's a man named J.K. Klein, who was for years, if not decades, sort of the unofficial photographer of the science fiction community. And he was always at conventions and especially always at the World Science Fiction Convention. And over the years, he just took thousands and thousands of photographs. And uh, he died a number of years ago, but his collection, his uh, essentially his photographs uh, wound up at the uh, University of California at Riverside's Special Collections Department, and a number of them have been digitized. And if you just Google UC Riverside Klein Collection, you can find them. And that Selassny picture was uh, one of the ones that was in the collection. And for the record, I'm 98.6% sure the woman in the picture was Selassny's wife, Judith. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but it's still, as I think I told you on Facebook, it's a good thing I never saw that picture when I was younger, or I might have started smoking <laughs> because it was just so cool. It was interesting when you said that because, you know, I was in high, I was like 17 or something when Selassie died. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, you know, I, I knew he had died of cancer and I knew that, mm -hmm. um, obviously, like anytime you saw a photo of him, he always had a, a pipe or a mm -hmm. cigarette or mm -hmm. something. And so that always yeah. made me very determined not to smoke because... Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had, I fortunate, I resisted peer... To, well, I am uh, somewhat older than you. And when I was 17, uh, and certainly, particularly when I was in my earlier teens, there was still uh, quite a bit of peer pressure. Not peer pressure, but just peer presence about smoking tobacco because everybody I knew practically smoked either up front in public or illicitly, depending on how old they were. Now, I had um, what cured me of smoking, not to get too autobiographical, is that my father was at my late father was actually a tuberculosis survivor. And he was seriously ill when I was about four years old. And when you have that presence of lung disease in your family, then that that was more than enough to keep me from ever smoking. Uh, and it's also, it's my understanding that Selazny was a heavy smoker, even by the standards of his time. And of course, that undoubt, you know, I don't see how that could not have uh, impacted his uh, eventually contracting cancer. Yeah, and it just seems like if you're a science fiction writer or a science fiction fan, I think you can't help but want to see as much of the future as you can. And mm -hmm. Seems like not smoking mm -hmm. is one of the easiest things you can do. Yeah. Oh, yeah.
Uh, the culture has changed so much in that regard. Um, I remember uh, when I was still in graduate school in, in teaching, uh, one time I was teaching a class where I showed the students the original movie of The Big Sleep with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, that classic film noir. And one of my students uh, said that she thought that all the characters ought to be in rehab just <laughs> because they were smoking and drinking so much. And I thought, well, welcome to the 1940s. Um, uh, you know, so the culture, that's a way in which the culture, at least uh, American culture, has changed dramatically for the better. Uh, and uh, and I actually do not know if Selazny smoked until the end or whether he quit somewhere along the way. Um, I, I think I may have known that at some point, but I'm sure that information's out there somewhere. But yeah, it's a very easy thing not to do. <laughs> It's funny. There was I forget who it was, but there was an author one time I heard said that he used cigarette smoking almost like a comma in his writing where any time, mm -hmm. you know, he needed some some bit of exposition to, you know, put or fit around the dialogue yeah. that he would have the character smoking. And oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. When everybody stopped smoking, he was kind of at loose ends for for what to what, you know. Right, right. I must I once heard Frederick Pohl or read an, uh, Frederick Pohl. Uh, say something similar that when he finally quit smoking that he had to make, he had to kind of retrain himself about his writing protocols because it was just automatic. When he sat down to write, he lit up a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if it was just bur burned down in the ashtray, it was still there. And I'll also mention that since the last time we talked, I did a local uh, bookstore virtual event because they have a uh, science fiction readers book club and we wound up talking or was that before um our last chat anyway they they talked about um the doors of his face the lamps of his mouth so Lasney's, uh collection and a couple of the younger people in the group made essentially the same comment that my student made back in the 1980s that, wow, you know, these characters in these stories, they're always smoking and they've always got a cocktail. And, you know, that was part of the culture. And that was also part uh, even, I mean, generally in American culture, but also that whole Greenwich Village hipster vibe thing that uh, Zelazny was so attuned to. Yeah. I was curious if you saw this. There was a piece that was published uh, uh, since we last talked on rawillumination.net, which I think is Robert Anton mm -hmm. Wilson's um, website. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it about your about your Selassie book. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I did. Uh, I did see that. Yeah. Um, and uh, for, for, uh, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Oh, because uh, just uh, this article mentions that Zelazny actually, you you know, you mentioned the last time we talked that you said your, your whole fiction writing career has been an attempt mm -hmm. to uh, try to replicate the experience for other people that you had reading the last line of A Rose for Ecclesiastes the first time you yes. read it. Mm -hmm. And and this entry says that Zelazny actually didn't think that story was that good and didn't initially submit it. And mm -hmm. uh, it that, just, that's... Mm -hmm. That's tech. That's sort of technically true. Um, the um, uh, and also maybe I should make full disclosure here that the person who wrote that uh, blog entry, um, Tom Jackson, is uh, an old friend of mine from my science fiction fandom days, and we are still uh, in touch. And so he uh, uh, knew about the, that the book was forthcoming, and he was big Selassie, is a big Selassie fan, too. Uh, the, well, what it was, was that Selassie wrote the story and realized that it, well, he understood that it was, among other things, scientifically out of date. So he really didn't submit it for a while. And that was not his first published story. He had published like a, a, almost 20 stories in Amazing and Fantastic in other places before uh, Rose for Ecclesiastes appeared. So it was his first, it was his first story in terms of composition, but it was not his first story that he published. And whether or not it was any good or whether it was, um, um, outdated, um, you know, I, I 
it's often hard to ascribe motives, but yeah, it's absolutely the case that he wrote that and put it aside, and those early sales uh, encouraged him to start sending it out again. Well, because this post, in addition to, you know, the science being out, outdated, I mean, it quotes him as saying, um, I felt I'd overdone it, that I'd thrown in everything but the Martian kitchen sink, that I'd overwritten it, mm -hmm. and that I'd made the character too introspective to be sympathetic. And mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, yeah. it's just such a great story. It's just, it, 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 that just seems to me a really interesting mm -hmm. uh, factoid or commentary on, on right, right. whether authors know what they've done or not. Yes, well, that's why we have critics. That's <laughs> why we have scholars is because when, when they're, you know, when I'm writing fiction, um, I know what I think is good and what isn't or what's better or what's worse. That doesn't necessarily correspond to what the rest of the world uh, will say about any given thing I write. And, um, well, one thing is that Zelazny was also, it, and that's a thing that he, even from a very early time, and it's important considering what um, um, he, the emphasis on him as a, this really um, is a phenomenal stylist, that he was always a little bit, suspicious of that there's i think i may have mentioned this last time there was a letter he wrote to damon knight um not law really after he had finished when he was uh i think it was, i can't remember if it was before or after he wrote lord of light but he's making that very point that he's come to you know kind of regret some of the um excess what he thought were excesses of his early stories and um you know wanted to we concentrate more on the story itself. And now I would respectfully suggest that's kind of a lost cause because I don't think the story is separable. I don't think you've got a story unit and a language unit that can somehow be disconnected. But uh, yeah, I mean, he was, uh, he was, um, he always wanted to tell a good story. Uh, I think really more, more than anything else. I mean, one thing I think about a lot, you know, I, I told you that growing up, the Chronicles of Amber were my favorite books. Mm -hmm. And then when I started going to science fiction conventions, people would say, sometimes would say, oh, he just wrote those for the money. And mm -hmm. as we talked about last time, I mean, I think this, mm -hmm. the reality is more complicated than that. But I mean, that did it cause is. me to think a lot about, you know, is something written for money? Like, say, say just say mm -hmm. for the sake of argument that he that that was true. Mm -hmm. What does that really mean? And to me, it doesn't mean a whole lot, really. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, you're getting to the uh, eternal question about uh, authorial intent, or even if what you're talking about, the circumstances that produce a piece of writing. And you could, if there's, you know, you can make the argument that even if he was, Lasney was just cashing the checks. And I, again, I don't want to be in denial about the degree to which there were times when that is exactly what he was doing, not in the sense of writing something that he had absolutely no investment in, but writing things where the impulse to do that thing as he would put it, if you read a lot of his work, uh, characters often say some use a phrase that somehow includes the phrase, and then I did that thing, as opposed <laughs> to I did it. Um, just this interesting little stylistic tick. But if you do that, I don't want to say that he didn't ever do that thing, because sometimes he did. But even if he did, um, uh, what I would argue is that it was never completely like he shut off you know his heart and just grounds grounded out that there was always some level of investment there and then of course to your point uh the, with that you know raises the question well so what if he did you know what matters is what's on the page and how people react to it Right. And I think about this a lot in terms of Arthur Conan Doyle. I, re I read a biography of him a long time ago. And the thing that really stuck in my mind was that he, you know, he really saw his important work as promoting the idea that you could talk to dead people and writing these historical novels to, to glorify mm -hmm. the British monarchy. And he, he put, you know, tons of time and effort and he did tons of research into those things. And then the Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes stories, he just kind of like tossed off and just saw them right. as cheap hack work that he was writing for money. And, mm -hmm. you know, to, to my mind, you know, the spiritualism stuff and the British monarchy stuff are, is basically a complete waste of time. And the right. Sherlock Holmes stories are great. And right. so right. Mm -hmm. that's sort of the, 
the the biggest example that comes to mind for me of of an author kind of not knowing what he has or what you know right mm -hmm. yeah i mean um and it's a sherlock holmes stories that have lasted uh and maybe a couple of the adventure novels like the lost world uh but yeah he was deeply into spiritualism and there's this fascinating um uh, where he had this friendship and simultaneous sort of, um, uh, well, he had this relationship with Harry Houdini, who was a notorious skeptic, and uh, what there and there was a lot, uh, just all sorts of interesting things going on there. But I remember hearing, or again hearing or reading, Orson Scott Card use that same example. Uh, in one of back in the again back in the eighties, I don't want to get too stuck in the eighties <laughs> uh, to sort of support his viewpoint of being suspicious about all that highfalutin literary stuff, um, and that's an oversimplification of what Scott was saying. But I've but I'm pretty sure that at one point he did use that example that you know uh, a, a, the, and of Arthur Conan Doyle, of H.G. Wells. Now, that's a little different because, well, H.G. Wells wrote a lot of what today we would call mainstream literary novels that are still, at, le at least in the history of Brit 20th century British literature, are well regarded. And, you know, if you're taking a course in British literature, you will know about those things. But those are not the novels that are still right there on the shelf at Barnes & Noble. Uh, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, like I, I told you, I just read your short story collection. It's called The mm -hmm. End of All Our Exploring. And in one of the stories, you have the, the, the narrator say, when I was in grade school and discovered the Sherlock Holmes stories, I had for a while fancied the notion of being a great detective and ultra rational thinker. Is that mm -hmm. autobiographical yeah. at all? Um, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh gosh, I'd forgotten that. Uh, I think that would, in honesty, that's probably more of an example of uh, putting, of having the character say something that I thought connected with other things that were going on in the story or were helping me to make the point. And that story you're taught, you're quoting from, it came out of the sky. I just, uh, the, my, my story about three teenagers who have a close encounter with the UFO in the swamps of southeastern North Carolina when they're in high school in the 1970s. And so if the question is, is the story autobiographical on one level? Obviously, on the other hand, uh, the experiences of that narrator's do not map sp uh, fully to my own um, at, on any number of levels. So there is, you know, past a certain point, you really do need to just make stuff up. But yeah, I mean, I read the Sherlock Holmes uh, stories. I mean, any kid who was a bookworm uh, like I was, like I suspect most of the people listening to this were, you encounter Sherlock Holmes uh, eventually, and you, you're all over it. Uh, and it's just great stuff. The um, probably, and of course, when I am barely old enough to remember the uh, having watched the original series of Star Trek when it was originally broadcast on network television. And of course, for kids uh, of that era, uh, it was Spock who was the, um, you know, in, the, the grand um, uh, king right. of, of all Rational. logic. Of all, right, he was the, the ultimate rationalism. But yeah, I think that there is that appeal, always that appeal there if somehow you can just think, you know, historically that you know, that's an enlight European Enlightenment impulse. If you can just think clearly and rationally and put all that sort of stuff, other stuff aside, then we can work it out, you know, that, that somehow everything will, will work out. I mean, but I, I know that you you have been really into UFOs and stuff like that. Like, mm -hmm. did did you mm -hmm. approach that from a like rationalist perspective as a kid, or now, or or not? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I hope I approached it from a rationalist. Um, I, I have to say immediately that I I come to the whole UFO thing as someone who is a complete skeptic, and uh, to 
quote, not to quote myself again too much, but earlier in the story, the narrator as an adult is telling somebody about the very meaning of the term UFO. And if you're talking about UFOs as, as unidentified flying objects, if you ask, are there UFOs? The answer is sure there are. There are all of these cases. Uh, and there's always that um, that five percent of recorded cases that over the years just cannot be explained. But if you then ask, are these UFOs alien visitors? My answer is almost certainly not. You know, I I can't say I've ever seen a UFO, and I am disinclined to believe that they are alien visitors. But I have, um, and really more as an adult than when I was a, a kid. I have been fascinated by UFO subculture, by just all of the apparatus that goes with it in the history, uh, particularly in this country, of um, you know the UFO phenomena and the people who are associated with it. And so, yeah, I've always been uh, deeply um, interested in that. In the introduction, Andy Duncan says that you, as a teenager, you briefly corresponded with Richard Shaver. Mm. Uh, yes, I did. Emphasis on briefly. <laughs> um, there. Well, as I've said, I think I've said before, I was a teenage science fiction fan in the sense of being deeply involved in fanzine fandom. We're talking about the days of mimeographed hard copy fanzines and the aspect of science fiction, the science fiction community that went with that. There was a um, fanzine called Title that was produced by a man named Don Brazier, who had been a member of what was known as First Fandom back in the 1930s and 40s. And he was an older man, and he was uh, the, like the director or had some position at the St. Louis Museum of Science and Natural History. But he produced, he did a fanzine, and I got his fanzine, and I wrote letters to his fanzine. And somehow he also had on his mailing list Richard Shaver and also and I, uh, Frederick Wortham. I don't know if that name means anything to most people the, anymore, the Seduction, but the of, seduction the of the Innocent. Yeah. But Wortham at that point in his life had also written a book called The World of Fanzines, which I confess I never read. And so Shaver was there uh, present in this fanzine. And I didn't... Uh, and I, I wrote a letter to the fanzine, and I, I, I this is burned in my mind. I, <laughs> I, in the letter, I used the phrase science and competent scientists. Don't know why, <laughs> being a snarky kid, I don't know. Uh, but then one day in the mail, I get an envelope, and in it is a handwritten letter from Richard Shaver containing Xeroxes, of photos of rocks that he claims <laughs> go back to the Duros and the underground, you know, the, all of his thing. Uh, yeah. about well, I think maybe sort of we should just explain. We should just explain for listeners that that mm -hmm. this guy Richard Shaver, um, I think, believed genuinely believed that he was picking up messages from this underground civilization called the Daros, who are these sort of sinister. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. characters who were, you know, transmitting mind control rays to the people on the surface right. or something like that. And these were published right. as nonfiction in Amazing Stories. Yeah, amazing. Stories. yeah, that was when Raymond Palmer was the editor. And uh, in fact, I'm looking, uh, I hope I, this isn't changing the um, tone of, of the, the sound quality here, but I'm looking at my bookshelf. And I, I'm seeing a book with the title Lemuria over there. I have no idea uh, what that is, but but yeah, Shaver was um, uh, was a, a notorious um, uh, figure in that regard. That they were being public. All of this obvious, you know, whack jobbery was being published as nonfiction and amazing stories when Raymond Palmer was editor, and Palmer was into the whole UFO scene as well. And then, uh, and of course, sales skyrocketed. Uh, I don't think amazing, I think I saw somewhere that amazing stories never had a higher circulation than when they were publishing the tales from Lemuria. But so I get that, and I'm like, you know, I'm 
15 years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, even as 15 years old, I thought, well, this is strange. But there it is. And that was the extent of my correspondence with Richard Shaver, because uh, wise beyond my years, I did not write back. <laughs> and so uh, that's the, that is uh, the sum total of my correspondence with Richard Shaver, but it does exist. You know, I, the reason I know all this stuff is that I did an episode. I did. I interviewed a guy. I think his name was Fred Natus, and he had written a book about about mm -hmm. the Shaver mystery and everything. Right. And right. sort of the thesis of his book was that prior to that, that science fiction was at least semi-respectable being linked with names like H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. And mm -hmm. that after that, uh, it was sort of permanently linked in the public mind with UFO nuts hmm. and kind of, you know, uh, lost whatever respectability it had had. Uh, I, that's an interesting thesis. I'm not, I'm not sure I would completely buy the part about its prior respectability because the fact is that Amazing Stories was, and all the rest of them were still disreputable pulp magazines that were reprinting H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and, you know, all of that. But they still had those, um, either those gaudy, but as we understand today, magnificent covers <laughs> and <laughs> art on them. So, uh, no, the book um, that I pulled off a shelf Let's see. The cover says, I'm just going to read from top to bottom, a startling book, Lemuria, The Lost Continent of the Pacific by Wilshar S. Survey, illustrated. And then there's a picture of some kind of um, uh, um, icon of a deity or something. The Mystery People of Mount Shasta. Price. $2.95. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, it's part of the Rosicrucian Library. What do you know? And don't ask me where I got this because I have no idea, but it's, it's sitting on my bookshelf. Um, but again, but so, so you see, I, th I hope that proves the point. It's endlessly fascinating. And I'll go ahead and say that uh, because this is something that's been on my mind very recently, especially with all the stuff that's been in the news about the uh, Navy uh, videos and that there's some reports supposedly coming this month uh, about uh, the government coming clean about what it knows and all of that. And I have been thinking about that again, and I actually have a um, what I refer to as my novel on indefinite hiatus that is the story that we've been talking about is the jumping off point for that. And it's a sort of further exploration of all of that. But to be honest, it's been kind of hard for me to get back into it because another thing that comes out more these days is kind of the darker underside of that that there is a line to be drawn between uh, aspects of the UFO community and QAnon uh, and the darker, more toxic levels of, conspira of conspiracy. And we all saw, you know, January 6th, what that can result in. So uh, as far as that's forced me to rethink things. I'm not saying I'll never go back to that particular writing project, but I'm going to have to think differently about it uh, if I do, when I do, when I do, repeat as necessary, <laughs> when I do. How far into that novel have you gotten? About 100 pages, maybe, including the material from the um, short story. And I have not really worked on it in a very long time, but it's there. Um, yeah, yeah, it's there. Uh, the, the novel... Um, the 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 story the material from the story is sort of put in as flashback sections because it begins with the narrator of the story being contacted by one of his teenage friends uh claiming that he knows what actually happened that night in the story and this triggers a the uh narrator as an adult going on a road trip uh, out west because I guess I'll, I'll I'll just explain for listeners that you're primarily a short story writer, yes. and this this book uh, collects I think most of the short stories that you've published over right, the last right. twenty years or so. Yes, it does. Um, the the book, and I, it would be accurate to say I'm 
to this moment exclusively short story <laughs> writer, at least in terms of my publications. No, everything in the end of all are exploring. The only th stories that I not in there are two very early works that were published in a uh, semi-pro uh, magazine uh, in the 90s that I just didn't really think fit in the book, and since the book was published, and I mentioned this last time, I have published one news story since the book uh, was published. But no, this is you know close to my uh, collected fiction to date. Was there a particular um, impetus for putting this book together? Like after you know twenty years, was there a moment where you said, "I want to do a, a collection of my short stories now"? Mm, well, uh, yes, and that occurred several years before the, the book was finally accepted for publication. Um, and I'm saying that because uh, if anybody is listening who is trying to, you know, to write or trying to market a book, uh, then just keep at it. Because I had, um, uh, I, I finally got to the point, and again, I'm a very slow, I'm not prolific. Now, by the stand, I, I by the standards of uh, academic writing, I'm insanely <laughs> prolific. By the standards of all of my fiction writing friends, I, 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 I just suck. <laughs> you know, I, I don't write very much at all. But eventually, when it got to the point that I had enough stories that I thought this would be enough for a book, then I started uh, thinking about it and sort of sending things um, around and querying people. And by that time, I you know, was uh, knew enough um, people in publishing that I could, you know, say, hey, what about this? And where it worked out was with uh, Fairwood Press and um, Patrick Swenson, and he did a wonderful job uh, of presenting the book. And uh, also when I was into my um, I don't know, somewhat to my surprise, he wanted to do the whole thing. You know, that just go ahead, and, and he thought all the stories, um, all the stories fit. What was it like going back to the early stories that you'd written? You know, fifteen years before. Or so, so strange, <laughs> <laughs> because um, a lot of the earlier stories in the book were me writing more in, um, again, to use an oversimplified phrase, a Southern Gothic mode. They much more reflect my interest in my own sort of cultural history. Uh, growing up in North Carolina with my parents uh, from South Carolina, based on historical incidents and events there, and uh, I, you know, not probably exactly the sort of thing I would be writing today. But there were plenty of moments where I said, "What did I write that? You know, did I write that?" And there also, I think, either depending on how you want to look at it, either braver or more reckless in how they present certain kinds of physical and emotional violence. I'm not sure that uh, that I would approach it in the same way um, if I were trying to deal with that material today. But no, I mean, I'm not, and I'm not trying to uh, damn those stories with faint praise. I'm very proud of them, and I think that they do some interesting things. But yeah, it was very strange. And not even that, but even stuff that I, by the time I was putting the book together, stuff that was... Um, more recent, but was still even, you know, a few years ago. And I guess no matter how much time has passed, there's always, at least for me, a sense of looking at something you wrote and that has been published. And it, there's almost inevitably a moment of, did I write that? Did I do that? So, and how can I do it again? <laughs> In the uh, intro, Andy Duncan says, a Brett Cox character is likely to respond to an intrusion of the marvelous, the supernatural, the horrific, by walking away and trying to forget it. Do you have mm -hmm. any thoughts about kind of where that approach comes from for you? That, I'll go ahead and acknowledge this now, because I don't think I have recently. That was a jaw-dropping moment for me when I read Andy's introduction and I had never really thought about it that way before. And as soon as I got to the last word in this sentence, I realized he was absolutely right. And um, I, I don't know where that comes from, except that I think that that is in many ways a fundamental impulse. Um, one of my favorite examples of that is in the in John Irving's novel The World According to Garp 
and not to, I won't spoil it for anybody who hasn't read it, even after all these years, but there's a death in the book. And then the death takes place essentially off stage, or the, the chapter ends before the actual death takes place. Then the next chapter starts. And then for the next 50 pages or so in the book, the character who died does not, not only does not appear, but isn't even mentioned. And then at some point, Garp finally says in talking to somebody, I miss him. And that's the first reference to the character since uh, the character's death. And I often cite that to students as an example of how people do process uh, things. In this case, grief of loss of a loved one, but how you are attempted to process any um uh, particular any kind of ex extraordinary event. I think that human beings are endlessly capable of denial, and I think that the events of the past year have have sadly proven that. So it's a, it's a belief that I stand by. Uh, now, one place, the one story where I did really do that deliberately, although I didn't frame it quite the way that Andy so insightfully did was the st one of the horror stories in the collection, See That My Grave Is Kept Clean, where I knew going into it that the woman who was narrating this story, that the whole move of the story was going to be towards this thing happening, but her just shoving it aside and pretending that it never happened and just refusing to even, refusing to, Dwell, at least dwell. I mean, she has to acknowledge it, but refusing to dwell on this uh, marvelous and in the story horrific event that occurs. Uh, I I see that all the time. It was just interesting to me, particularly given your interest in Zelazny, whose heroes are so often, you know, that they face even the most incredibly dangerous situations with total mm -hmm. confidence and aplomb. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that is such a tradition in, in fantastic fiction of adventure stories mm -hmm. and Conan the Barbarian and all that kind of stuff. And just for whatever reason, you never gravitated in that direction. No, I did. And that, well, that was a direction in the story that my recent story that's not included in the book, um, the uh, Abend in the Air. As I said in the when we talked before, that was my first attempt ever at trying to cover some of that territory. And where I was thinking, had Zelazny in the back of my head uh, when um, I wrote it. No, I, as for the stories in the collection, yes, I very much was motivated by my readings of Zelazny and a lot of other writers. I'm not sure that um, I can point to any, I, I can't point to any story in the book and say, well, that I was, that's my Zelazny story because that's such a story really isn't there. Um, I, I am much more convinced of, uh, I don't know any other way to put it, the frailty of people and the uncertainty uh, of so much of life. And um, that I think that tends to come out in the stories. We'll say a little bit more about that process of writing a bent in the air because you had just finished writing this this whole book this 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 is a mm -hmm. five year long project writing about yeah oh, oh yeah yeah at least uh, I I I and talk about being in denial I have chosen not to remember the exact number of years <laughs> I've been working on the on the Zelazny book I could go back and look at the original contract but I'm not going to punish myself uh, in that way um, yeah I mean I want I had. An idea, uh, I was asked to write a story for this anthology called Portals that was about stories about portals. And I had a long time ago written the beginning of a story that was kind of informed by my reading of Zelazny. This was even, you know, when I was still in process of, in the book and just to try something different. And I never could figure out really what kind of story needed to go with it. But then when I had the uh, charge of writing a story about portals, that helped it fall into place. And so I was, uh, you know, the, the protagonist of the story is um, the, um, is a, um, kind of um, anti-hero. I mean, he's a criminal who is awaiting execution and freely admits he did exactly what he was convicted of doing. Uh, 
but he has a chance to get out of it by performing this task for um, the person who is in charge of the um, area that uh, where the story takes place. And if that sounds all ill-defined, it's because it is. I, I can't offer the story as any kind of masterpiece of world building, but it's uh, still a sort of, you know, secondary fantasy world. And so I did have Zelazny in mind, not only the Amber books, but uh, I was also thinking about the Dilvish stories that uh, Dilvish the Damned and Zelazny published a novel and a story collection uh, for that and uh, dealing with that particular character. And the other way in which um, I could claim Zelazny's influence is that in that story, I was trying to do some, well, I was trying to do something I had done before. I had not tried writing, but I still think of um, sort of old school as a, a sword and sorcery story. And I also deliberately uh, put in the story something else I had not done before. And I don't think this is too much, too much of a spoiler because it kind of starts being talked about or referenced fairly early in the story. But not the protagonist, but the other main character in the story is a non-binary character in this world. And uh, I wanted to do that. Um, I wanted to, to uh, have that happen in the story. And uh, I, think it, I think it worked out okay. I hope it did. But I mean, last time I talked to you, you described the story as your sword and sorcery story with no swords and very little sorcery. So even mm -hmm. when writing in this kind of more Zelazny adventure mode, you still yeah. kind of gravitate away from that, from sword fights well, and things. Yeah, well, Zelazny was an expert fencer, and I am not. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing about it. The one place where I did cut myself some slack somewhat indulgently is there's a scene in the story where when the protagonist uh, is uh, sent on the quest and it's just within, barely within walking distance, so the authorities send him out to do this without a horse, and he's griping about, well, you know, why can't I have a horse? And frankly, I was writing the story, and I don't know much about horses either. <laughs> and I thought, well, I can find this out. I can research this. Well, I don't really have time to research this. If I'm going to get this turned in, ah, he can walk. So, um, <laughs> so that's where, you know, that was sheer expediency on my part. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is, um, um, I guess I'm enough of a contrarian that if I am, um, confronted with, uh, an expectation, I will start thinking about how to, um, defy it. So, uh, I don't want to cast myself as some grand rebel there because, <laughs> Uh, I'm a little too old for that, but yeah, yeah. I wanted to see if I could t take these, uh, take that situation, take that kind of world, and do something different with it. But I will say that the final sentence of that story—it's not up to a rose for Ecclesiastes level, but but the cadence of the conclusion of the story—I was very much thinking of Selassie. Yeah. That's cool. I also wanted to ask you about, you have um, two stories in this collection where there's kind of a husband and wife character who are going on a road trip and they uh -huh. encounter some weird thing. And actually, you said in one of the notes, um, uh, all locations depicted in my whole world lies waiting exist, as does one of the doors. So could uh -huh. you explain that? Oh, well, that story is based on um, one of the first uh, um, tr trips no, no it was uh not one of the first trips my wife and i took together as a couple but the first extended road trip we took um when we were uh after we moved to vermont because i have a uh she has a daughter in seattle and a daughter in telluride colorado and a daughter in baltimore and a daughter in atlanta so we have all kinds of reasons to travel went back when we could travel and we um so we went out to seattle and then came back but through telluride and when we were i was actually going to have uh we meet an old high school friend of mine who was an attorney uh in the seattle area for lunch and we drove by and there was this door just kind of propped upright in, in the middle of this sort of overgrown field. And I paused, stopped and took a picture of it and just, I said, well, I'll file that away. 
And then the rest of the story just emerged uh, emerged from that. I will say that um, I had, and I swear to you, this is the truth. I had to manufacture uh, a good bit of the conflict with the couple in that story uh, because uh, my Janie and I were not having those particular issues on that on that particular trip, which did not stop. Uh, no less an authority than Michael Bishop telling me after he read the story, well, this is you and Janie, isn't it? And I thought, like, <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> you know? And Michael said he, he has been very, he has cited uh, how much he, to me, how much he liked, enjoyed that particular story. And, and that that pleases me no no end. Uh, I, I cannot um, overstate my affection and respect for Michael Bishop as both a man and a writer. Yeah, no, he's amazing. I've, I've, you know, I, he was actually maybe the first person, one of the first couple of people I met at my very first science fiction convention, and mm -hmm. has always oh. stuck out in my mind as just possibly the well, nicest person I ever met. Uh, oh, oh, you, oh, uh, there's a, the, you can't overstate it, and uh, you were very lucky if he was one of the first writers you met at a science fiction convention, and I hope you haven't been too bitterly disappointed since. <laughs> <laughs> And any of the rest of us you may you may have encountered. No, no, my, Michael, Mike's just the best. Yeah, and I did interview him. I don't remember offhand what uh, what episode it was, but if you go back looking through the archives, uh, uh -huh. it's in there somewhere. Yeah, and there's another story that I can't say I've tried to replicate in my own work, but his novelette, The Quickening, it won a Nebula Award uh, back in the early '80s. I read that one. That that floored me. I was just absolutely astonished uh, by that story. I still am. Yeah. Okay. So before we run out of time, I just had a couple of sort of random things I wanted to ask you. So sure. in two of these stories, the sexual component of alien abduction and it came out of the sky when people are abducted by UFOs, the first they get shine, first blue light gets shines on them and then red and then white. And I was just wondering mm -hmm. if that's, is that part of UFO lore or is that? Um, I don't know about the specific colors, but there is, that's part of what I've read in terms of abduction narratives is that, you know, there is a change in lighting uh, among other things. So, and that seemed to me to be uh, a pretty strong visual image to use that did have some basis in, uh, in these um, accounts. Okay, and then the other thing I noticed was that uh, both the sea captain in The Light of the Ideal and the girl inventor in the Amnesia Helmet are named Cantrell. And I was wondering if there's any connection there, or is that a name that has any significance? Or Well, um, there are, they are Marlena Cantrell. <laughs> you may, or, again, you may or may not believe this. I did not realize that until you just told me. I had it never registered with me that that name appeared in both stories. Honest to God, it <laughs> didn't. So that is just me failing to be sufficiently um, to bring a sufficient variety of names to my <laughs> characters. There's no, uh, I maybe there's some deep seated significance. I mean, well, now you um, can do a crossover I, uh, event or something. Oh, 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 with those stories, Lord, I hope not. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, I mean, it was a, I mean, I knew people named Cantrell when I was growing up, but not in any close or significant sense. So it just, <laughs> you got me. I, I, I hadn't realized there, there was that duplication there. Mm -hmm. um, and then in one of the more recent stories, but this is pre-COVID, I think it was 2018 or, mm -hmm. or possibly earlier. Um, but, but there's a line, sometimes I can't help blaming China for profiting so from our catastrophe. Now, don't get huffy. You know, I never bought into that conspiracy crap about them being responsible for the first flu. And mm -hmm. it's just sort of funny now in retrospect. Oh, how oh yeah. Strikes. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, you're referring to the title story of the book, The End of All Our Exploring, which is one of the uh, two original stories in the book. It hadn't been previously published. And, well, yeah. In fact, I have one of my um, um, uh, academic friends, um, out in the science fiction studies world uh, made that point to me when she uh, about that story. And yeah, uh, it is a story about um, uh, 
it is a post it's a post pandemic story and it is also a story about a couple uh, about a couple who are estranged and are one of them wants to reunite in this post pandemic world and there is a conspiracy theory lingering in the background of the story about the role of china uh, in the uh, virus, and now in the story, I've kind of said it as a, as mosquito born. Uh, you know, it's not uh, an airborne virus, but yeah. When my uh, when she told me that, all I could think of was, oh, great! For once in my life, I'm a sci-fi predictive sharpshooter, and this is what <laughs> I come up with. Wonderful, but yeah, I mean, and, and of course, you can, um, and of course, Sarah Pensker did this on a much much more significant scale um, uh, in uh, her, no her novel, A Song for a New Day, that was published in 2019 and is about the, uh, the, the um, sledgehammer effect on uh, performing art, among other things about the sledgehammer effect of performing arts uh, in a world that's been ravaged by both fears of terrorism and a pandemic. So... Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think I I'll cite that not as proof of my prog prognosticating powers because it's no such thing. But I will say that this is how things like that happen in science fiction stories. Is that if you're paying attention, if you have you know some sense of general trends in your own present day, um, you know you can you can work it out. Uh, to a specific um, uh, to a kind of scenario like that, but but yeah, I, I mean it is probably the only one of my stories that that I can think of that does uh, have that that kind of um, sort of faux predictive element to it. But I appreciate you mentioning that because I'm 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 very fond of that story. I wouldn't have titled the collection after it if I wasn't. Yeah. And then also um, in the introduction, uh, Andy Duncan refers to you as Colonel Cox, Vermont State Militia. He says you'll have to ask him about that. Uh -huh. so. Yeah. Um, I teach at Norwich University, which is an historically military college. It is, in fact, the oldest private military um, college in the United States. And uh, the most, the majority, uh, the large majority of the students are in a core, in the Corps of Cadets uh, for the school and are in military uniforms. And all full time uh, tenure track faculty are required to be in military uniform as well. And we are assigned military rank commensurate or at least somehow matched up with our academic rank. So my uh, acad my military rank with <laughs> uh, with uh, that matches my being a uh, full professor is uh, of lieutenant colonel, and this is within the system of the Vermont State Militia, which is basically the Norwich faculty, and this was constructed. Uh, long time ago to go along with the idea of the faculty being in uniform. So um, if New Hampshire invades, we're the first line of defense. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's a very strange thing. Um, I, I freely admit that, but you know, there it is. So yeah, I do have that. Um, uh, I do hold that rank. And I quickly add, I have never served in the actual military. My father was a radio operator on a B-17 in World War II. Uh, he served in the military. Um, this is something that's specific uh, to my job. But it's, you know, it makes for an interesting environment. I'll also add about the uh, Andy's introduction that... Uh, over in two consecutive days after the book came out, I had two different people here in among my friends in Vermont, one who's a member within the a faculty at the Vermont College of Fine Arts, the other of whom is a friend of our, mine and Jeannie's within the theater community, say, and independent of each other, two different locations, two different times, they both said, basically, I'm reading your book. I'm liking it a lot. The stories are good. But that introduction. Oh my God, that's <laughs> wonderful. That was so great. I so enjoyed that. So I'm happy to report that Andy's introduction 
is uh, maybe a bigger hit <laughs> than, the, than the stories in the book, which is fine. I, I appreciated him doing that. Um, Andy has known me very well for a long time. So um, what he wrote is mostly true. Yeah, no, it's it's an amazing introduction. I, I I actually read it to my girlfriend. I was like, you have to hear this introduction. This is the nicest oh, okay. introduction I've ever heard. Like, yeah, isn't I it hope though? someone will write an introduction like this for me someday. Like, oh, I'm sure I'm sure they will. No, Andy, Andy, uh, not only stepped up to the plate, but hit it out of the park. And uh, and as I said, it's um, you know I I I, I accept it gratefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're pretty much out of time. So do you have just any uh, any other final thoughts or any other? No, just to just to f a final plug that the book is the end of all our exploring. It was published by Fairwood Press in 2018, but it is still very much available from the publisher and through the usual outlets. Um, and um, it is available. I'm pretty sure it's available as an ebook. It, that was another educational point was the number of people who asked me when it came out, is it going to be an ebook? <laughs> We're not going to get it as an ebook. And they asked that about the Zelazny book as well. And of course, the Roger Zelazny from the University of Illinois Press. Um, and that is also available through, um, through the usual outlets and also uh, as an ebook. So if you want to read about Roger Zelazny, get that book. And if you have any curiosity about, the sort of um, odd stories I write, <laughs> then, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of them in, in one convenient location. Yeah. Uh, no, this has been great, Brett. And so we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with F. Brett Cox. And again, the book is called The End of All Our Exploring. So, Brett, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me back. I really enjoyed it. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to F. Brett Cox for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.